First, uh, it's a great honor for me to be here today meeting with all of you distinguished radiologists in Erbil, uh, Kurdistan. Uh, some of you are our residents, some of you are newly graduates, board certified uh, radiologists, which, uh, and some of you are our teachers and our mentors. Uh, first, I want to thank the guys inside the company for giving me this opportunity to be here uh, and talk to you and meet with uh, all of you. Uh, I am Dr. Ahmed Dhiya Abdul Wahab. I am a clinical and interventional radiologist in uh, the Department of Radiology in Razgari Teaching Hospital in Erbil. Uh, today is a special event for uh, the guys inside for the release of their new products and it's a special event for me too. First, because I get to meet with all of you guys. Second, because there are some very special guests here today with me. That's my beautiful wife and my daughter and uh, son. Uh, it's the first time they all attend uh, to any of my talks. Anyway, today uh, I, we decided, I decided to talk about ultrasound of the neck. There is more than thyroid nodules. First, before uh, we uh, continue, uh, this talk as well as many other talks uh, are available on my YouTube channel. Just write Dr. Ahmad Abdul Wahab in the search and uh, it will be there. And don't forget to subscribe to see more talks and more uh, lectures. We are updating it like every, every week. Uh, things that are we going to talk about, we will talk about everything except thyroid. Thyroid is a big talk. We need a whole new topic, new lecture for it. So we will talk about how to differentiate masses in the thyroid bed in patients with a prior thyroidectomy. Review the features of abnormal neck nodes in the differentiated thyroid cancer and discuss the more common cystic lesions in the neck. Recognize limitations of, ultra, uh, in, of ultrasound imaging in non-nodal masses of the neck. We will not talk about thyroid, we will not talk about parathyroid, and we will not talk about salivary glands. So the important things are we will not talk about it. <laughs> anyway, pre- and post-operative ultrasound in thyroid malignancy. The ultrasound is superior to CT and MRI in the evaluation of local metastatic disease in the neck. And in differentiated thyroid malignancies, that is medullary thyroid carcinoma and papillary thyroid carcinoma. And it's very excellent in evaluation of the thyroid bed for recurrence and local metastasis. And in papillary and medullary thyroid carcinoma metastasized to ipsilateral jugular chain, that's from level two to level four and sometimes level five. However, keep in mind, it might, most of the patients, they forgot which side they had the tumor on. So you'll have to scan both sides, right and left and some of the tumors metastasize to the contralateral side. So uh, complete scanning of the neck is mandatory. Uh, ultrasound is highly sensitive for follow-up of patients with thyroid malignancy. It's reported to be up to 94%, even more sensitive than uh, whole body uh, iodine scanning and more sensitive than uh, thyroglobulin level. So, what are the neck masses in the thyroid bed? They might represent local recurrence, central nodal recurrence, post-operative changes, cervical thymus, Zinger's diverticulum, central compartment nodes, could be normal, could be Hashimoto's thyroiditis or reactive lymph nodes, etc., etc. Regrowth of residual thyroid tissue, especially if the patient did not receive radioactive iodine therapy. Regrowth of residual thyroid tissue is, is very possible, and of course, the parathyroid glands. First, we want to talk about what's called the central compartment. What do we mean by central compartment of the neck? It's everything between the carotid arteries, two carotid arteries. Everything uh, between them is, we call it the central compartment or level six. So regarding recurrence of the, parath uh, of the papillary thyroid carcinoma in the thyroid bed, 70% uh, of these lesions are circ circumscribed, hypoechoic, smooth margins, they have color flow. It's a very important thing to notice. Plus minus calcification and cysts. And the uh, literature suggests that calcification and cysts are very good predictors of recurrence. So we should pay very good attention to this. Uh, should be differentiated from post-operative changes like suture granuloma and fat necrosis. We'll talk about this in a, in a minute. This uh, patient uh, had a previous thyroidectomy for papillary thyroid carcinoma and now is scanned for because of elevated uh, uh, thyroglobulin level. And during scanning, there was this small nodule 
at the site of the thyroidectomy, at the th thyroid bed. And you can see it here, it has some possibly micro calcification within it. It is smooth, well defined, hypoechoic, and on color Doppler, there is some vascularity inside it. And FNA was done and it revealed recurrence of the papillary thyroid carcinoma. Post operative changes we said might include suture granuloma. What do we mean by suture granuloma? Uh, around the sutures of the surgery, uh, inflammatory tissue uh, develops and results in what's called suture granuloma. It appears as echogenic foci, can mimic microcalcification. Usually, they have paired appearance, okay, simulating a blood vessel. However, uh, there is no flow in it, okay. Usually, more than one millimeter in diameter with no color flow in it. You can see this. It's very similar to the previous lesion we've seen before. It's uh, hypoechoic, it's well defined, and there are two paired lines that might simulate a blood vessel. However, on Doppler scanning, there is absolutely no flow within it. So this was just a suture granuloma. This is a case of 56-year-old uh, male with history of previous par uh, papillary thyroid carcinoma, and now presented for scanning. There was this lesion at the site of the thyroidectomy. It was well-defined, hypoechoic, with two linear lines inside it. On color Doppler, there is absolutely no flow inside, confirming this is a suture granuloma. It's not a recurrence. However, on further scanning, another lesion is seen here. It's also hypoechoic and well-defined, with some color flow on Doppler scan, and this was the recurrence tumor. Okay? So, if you can see both recurrence and suture granulomas in the same patient, it does not mean if you see suture granuloma, does not mean there is no recurrence. It can be both. Something, it's not common, but it might be seen, and we should be careful to keep it in mind. It's what called cervical ectopic thymus. Cervical uh, ectopic thymus is sometimes is just an ectopic part of the thymic tissue developing in the cervical region. Sometimes it's the thoracic thymus herniating or extending upward into the root of the neck especially in young people who are have a high ability to hyperextend their neck, it is uh, it can be seen every now and then. So, some embryology, the thymus develops from the third and fourth pharyngeal pouches and descends from the angle of the mandible to the mediastinum. Any interruption during this descent res will result in abnormal position. Most commonly, it's seen in the lateral neck and suprasternal regions. It appears as a visible or palpable mass, or it can be incidental finding. As we said, sometimes it's just superior herniation of the thoracic thymus, especially in young people with high ability to hyperextend their neck. For example, in this case, you can see there is a well-circumscribed homogeneous mass. This, this is the thyroid. This is the inferior thyroid artery. And there is something here, which is a little bit weird looking. It's hypoechoic containing multiple uh, septi, let's say, okay? And if you follow it up, it extends deep into the chest. Uh, they can have punctate or echogenic foci, which are represent septi or calcification. This is a thymus. It's not a recurrence, it's not a tumor, it's not a lymph node, it's just a thymus, herniating into the root of the neck. Again, another case of uh, cervical thymus. Here, you can see there is, this is a thyroid gland, and there is something deep to it here, with uh, some punctate uh, areas of septations and things like that. And on the axial scan, you can see it lateral to the thyroid. And it is, if you follow it up, it extends into the uh, chest. And this is a cervical thymus or herniation of the mediastinal thymus. This is a case of 16-year-old uh, male with a neck mass that is very suspicious looking. It's ill-defined, contains multiple calcific fossa, uh, micro calcifications, uh, expensile, and it turned out to be a papillary thyroid carcinoma in a 16-year-old patient. However, during the scanning, we can see there is something here, and this is and, uh, seen in the axial scanning anterior to the internal jugular vein, and in the same patient, we have a papillary thyroid carcinoma with cervical thymus. So it's a very interesting to find both in the same patient. Another case of a 26-year-old with an increased thyroglobulin level of 3.2 which is high, and history of previous papillary thyroid carcinoma, and you can see here again, this is the thymus protruding into the bed of the thyroid gland. There is no thyroid gland here, it's previous thyroidectomy, but the thymus is protruding into the thyroid gland, into the thyroid bed, sorry. 
uh, the same patient in the thyroid bed during further scanning, this tiny nodule is seen. In addition to the uh, cervical thymus, this tiny nodule is seen here with color flow in it and during uh, FNA was done for this tiny nodule and the cytology was positive for recurrent papillary thyroid carcinoma. So any lesion with internal vascularity should, especially if previous history of, thy of thyroid carcinoma, should be FNA. And what uh, they are doing now is not only the cytology FNA, there is something called thyroglobulin assay. They wash the needle of the FNA with saline, like 0.5 cc to 1 cc, and they send it for thyroglobulin assay. Sometimes the cytology is negative, but thyroglobulin is positive. Again, it indicates recurrence of the uh, previously removed carcinoma. Uh, be careful of something, it's rare, but it happens, something called intrathyroidal thymus. Intrathyroidal thymus happens every now and then. Uh, you can see this is a lesion within the thyroid gland. It's completely surrounded by the thyroid gland or all uh, directions. And the echo pattern is typically uh, similar to that of the thymus. And it was an intrathyroidal thymus remnant of the thymic tissue within the thyroid gland. Something, it's rare to be seen, but if uh, we should be careful to not miss it. It's what's called Zinger's diverticulum. Zinger's diverticulum is just a pulsion diverticulum from the esophagus. Sometimes in patients with uh, thyroidectomy, previous thyroidectomy, Zinger's diverticulum arises from the esophagus into the thyroid bed, usually, usually on the left side, Okay, and you can see it has a very typical appearance of this hypoechoic thick wall with variable uh, echo patterns inside. The trick here is to scan the patient on two different uh, occasions. It will change in size, change in shape, change in echo pattern because the contents will be different. So if you see it different between two different scans, keep in mind possibility of Zinger's diverticulum. Uh, might mimic a malignant thyroid nodule. Uh, L try to look for a connection with the esophagus. Look here deep. You you might be able to see a connection to the esophagus to confirm that this is a Zinger's diverticulum. Here it might look like a thyroid nodule. This is a thyroid gland, and someone might think this is a thyroid nodule. There is no vascularity. It changes in shape between different scans. And if we look carefully, it we might find the connection to the esophagus. Okay, this is a very nice uh, case. I will show you now. Uh, in fact, it's a funny case. Uh, Zinker's diverticulum, typical hypoechoic pattern with different echo, uh, echoes inside. And uh, on scanning, it's connected to the esophagus. You can see this neck. However, uh, someone decided to do FNA for this lesion. And imagine the surprise when the cytology came, vegetable cells. So it was a very I don't know, funny thing. <laughs> anyway, so keep it in mind, Zinker's diverticulum. Again, what are the neck masses in the thyroid bed? We have to be careful for the central compartment uh, nodes. The central compartment is everything between the two carotids. This is what we call central compartment or level six. Uh, they might remain after surgery due to limited or incomplete central component dissection. Nodes can be big, example in Hashimoto's, okay? Uh, regrowth of uh, or residual thyroid tissue left during surgery and we said it's more if the patient does not receive radioactive iodine we might expect to see that because surgeons do total thyroidectomy is not in fact a total thyroidectomy it's subtotal they tend to remove parts of the thyroid to because they are afraid for the recurrent laryngeal nerve so they remove th uh, yani most of it not all of it and this part will regrow and becomes a recurrent thyroid uh, masses Parathyroid glands, uh, might see, we might see them. Most of the patients, they have signs and symptoms of parathyroid adenomas uh, or have parathyroid hyperplasia like elevated calcium and elevated parathyroid hormone. And most of them, they know they have a parathyroid problem. So what to look for in the cervical lymph nodes and differentiated thyroid cancer? Ultrasound in pre-op patients is very accurate in the lateral nodes from level two to level five. Pre-op, ultrasound is used to determine the necessity and the extent of nodal dissection. We should tell the surgeon which compartments you need to open and dissect and remove and clean and things like that. While CT reported to have a greater sensitivity in the central nodes, in level six nodes. 
Microscopic nodal metastasis impact recurrence and may affect survival. We will talk about that in a, in a minute. So, what are the ultrasound features in the uh, in cervical lymph nodes in differentiated thyroid cancer? Pre-op ultrasound mapping pre prior to surgery is now part of the guidelines of the newly diagnosed parathyroid carcinoma. Uh, sorry, papillary thyroid carcinoma. If pathologic nodes in the central or lateral compartment, they are removed at initial surgery. Keep in mind, nodal morphology is more important than the size. Small nodes can be malignant. Large nodes can be benign. The shape of the nodule of the lymph node is more important than the size. Uh, I think you all uh, familiar with this drawing of the different compartments of the neck, the level five, uh, level uh, the central compartments that, uh, and I will not talk about them because I think we all know it. Uh, at least we have some uh, guidelines for it. So, what are the features of the normal nodes? Just briefly, usually they are elongated, oval shape with central hilum, central fatty hilum on the longitudinal view. On the uh, transverse view, they are more or less rounded in appearance. However, not always, you know, fatty hilum is not uh, mandatory for a normal node. We can see here is a small, elongated, oval shaped, smooth lymph node with no fatty hilum. Again, it's a normal node. You know, no short, uh, it's not mandatory for a normal node to have a uh, uh, hilum. Just Keep in mind when reporting ultrasound, I, I keep seeing reports from everywhere every now and then. The lymph nodes should be reported in shortest dimension only. Long dimension is not important, it's not relevant. You might have a node that's four centimeter long and three millimeter width, wide. So, your ball there is a lymph node that measures three millimeter in shortest dimension, and that's it. No one cares about the long dimension, okay. The short is the important thing. Anywhere. Anywhere. Everywhere in the body. Lymph radiology is not sensitive to detect uh, malignant lymph node infiltration. The only criteria that we use and depend is the shortest dimension of the lymph node. So, what will happen if the lymph node is involved by a malignant process? You will see absent fatty hilum. Cystic change, calcification, it will appear rounded or elongated in shape, abnormal color Doppler pattern, sometimes hyperechoic changes, and some have a mass effect on the adjacent jugular vein. For example, you can see here, there is, this is a lymph node that is irregular shaped. It's of heterogeneous echo pattern. Uh, fatty hilum is not completely visible. Okay, and you can see another lymph node here. They are small, but it's elongated, higher than or longer than wide, okay, with no fatty hilum. These are a malignant infiltrated lymph node. Sometimes you might have a lymph node that is retain its normal oval shape with central hilum. However, the hilum is irregular. It's large, it's ill-defined, indicating something wrong there and this was a malignant lymph node by the way so even the hilum itself if it is not completely regular and small and vascular this might indicate a tumor infiltration uh, this is also another lymph node it is elongated oval shape smooth okay but there is markedly different echo pattern heterogeneous echo pattern this is a highly suspicious especially in patients with a known primary you can see here this is a metastatic papillary uh, carcinoma. Uh, it's a lymph node. It appears oval shaped. The hilum is preserved with this small echogenic focus that is a little bit suspicious. So a needle was inserted and uh, if you are uh, good with the FNA procedure, you try to take from the abnormal uh, echogenic lesion. Like here, this uh, needle was inserted there and the result was positive for recurrence for metastatic involvement sorry this is again a lymph node that is show some loss of the fatty hilum oval shaped okay small size but the fatty hilum is not present not obvious and a needle was inserted and it was a metastatic papillary carcinoma okay this is a 53 year old patient with papillary thyroid carcinoma on two year follow up you can see there is a lymph node here that's somewhat irregular outline with loss of the fatty hilum and 
upon fur uh, it has some calcifications upon further scanning other lymph nodes are seen these lymph nodes show areas of cystic changes within the lymph node itself and some calcific foci okay and again further scanning this is the cystic uh, changes within the lymph node some calcification you can see acoustic shadowing here and, uh, and a needle was inserted into the node uh, the lymph node and uh, notice that this needle was inserted through the internal jugular vein okay so just a simple message if you if the only way to access the lymph node is through the vein don't worry go for it it's a vein just like putting a cannula just press on it for like one two minutes and blood will stop and everything will be okay okay and it was a uh, positive for uh, uh, metastatic lymph nodes something uh, to be considered is that the echogenicity of the metastatic lymph node can be different than the original tumor yeah what we mean by that this is a case of uh, malignant uh, papillary thyroid carcinoma in the thyroid gland you can see this tumor is heterogeneously hypoechoic pattern irregular however the lymph node that's involved it appears iso to hyperechoic so it, it you know, not uh, mandatory for the metastasis to have the same echo pattern as the original tumor it can have a different echo pattern not only uh, the same this is a patient of uh, 43 year old three months history post thyroidectomy the surgeon decided to go and remove the thyroid gland without proper pre-op ultrasound mapping of the uh, lymph nodes and again you can see after three months sarcoglobin level doesn't is not coming down it's still elevated on uh, ultrasound scan there are multiple lymph nodes here and here and here all of them look suspicious rounded some of them elongated abnormal vascularity from the periphery some show cystic changes and it was multiple cyst uh, multiple uh, nodal metastasis this is a case who's a 38 year old vocalist he's a singer okay so uh, he had uh, some thyroid tumor and he was reluctant to do the surgery because he was afraid on his to his voice because he's living from that you can see there is a lymph node here that has a partial hilum half of the hilum is here the other half is not there within the lymph node there are cystic changes and there is some mass effect on this internal jugular vein you can see the lymph node compressing the vein which is a very suspicious cystic changes mass effect in patients with non-primary come on this is uh, highly suspicious uh, the same patient here other lymph nodes you can see here it's a little bit hyper echoic okay and another lymph node in the same patient that have this echogenic focus so it's not enough to scan the lymph node for the hilum you need to scan what type of the hilum where is the hilum how large is the hilum it's not only there is a lymph node and that's it okay and fna was inserted into the hyper uh, echoic lesion and it was of course metastatic involvement one of the features of malignancy is the disorganized vascularity in the metastatic lymph node. You can see this lymph node, uh, multilobulated, abnormal echogenicity, heterogeneous pattern, loss of fatty hilum. On Doppler scanning, you can see there is more uh, heterogeneous, disorganized vascularity, more from the periphery than from the center. So again, this is a highly suspicious for malignant involvement. What we need to do in cases like this one when you have multiple areas of vascularity try as much as possible to aspirate from the uh, avascular part you don't go into the vascular part you'll have a lot of blood little cells try as it's not that easy but you have to try to go into the avascular part okay first to have more cells from the lymph node and second if you FNA the vascular part the lymph node will enlarge in size post fna due to the hemorrhage for example here you can see this a needle into the lymph node that was inserted into a vascular component and after the biopsy the lymph node is larger in size due to, to hemorrhage within the lymph node it's not a big uh, problem but you will have a bloody aspirate and little amount of cells so try as much as possible to go into the less vascular part of the lymph node uh, again we said mass effect is a very important thing to look for you can see these are malignant lymph nodes definitely they are 
calcified abnormal high lump abnormal eco pattern and they are markedly compressing the internal jugular vein here you can see this is a common carotid and this is the internal jugular it's compressed here and here and even you can see the mass effect in the elongated view here very obvious this patient is a known case of hyperparathyroidism uh, but during the scanning uh, a lesion was seen on the right side while the, the nuclear system scan decided that reported as on left side parathyroid adenoma so the nuclear guys nuclear medicine guys says it's on the left side we see this lesion something on the right side again during further scanning you can see this a six millimeter five millimeter nodule in the thyroid it's on the right side so is it a parathyroid in an abnormal position if it is a parathyroid why the nuclear medicine says it's on the left side so of course in this case uh, fna is indicated and this was a malignant thyroid tumor this is a case of two months post-op thyroglobulin level is rising and you can uh, the same patient of the parathyroid adenoma they remove the thyroid gland and on two months after uh, the surgery the thyroglobulin level is still rising and on scanning in spite of having only five or six millimeter nodule in the thyroid it's very small there is an abnormal lymph node that has a rounded shape some disorganized vascularity heterogeneous ecopatter and mass effect on the internal jugular vein and uh, fna was done from this lymph node which is how close is it is to the jugular vein and it was a metastasis so the size of the original tumor does not determine the likelihood of the metastasis it can be very small tumor with lymph nodes metastasis what are the pitfalls or the caveats that might happen keep in mind that absent vati hilum reported to be the least accurate in predicting malignancy you do not depend on the fatty hilum as an indicator for malignant involvement it is the least accurate if fna is negative if abnormal morphology of the lymph node still could be a metastasis so if you can use the thyroglobulin assay just wash the needle with saline and send it for thyroglobulin level to detect possible uh, nodal involvement calcification and abnormal doppler they predict the metastasis in level six nodes hashimoto's and papillary thyroid carcinoma a lot of people with hashimoto's can develop papillary thyroid just two conditions uh, cons coincidental Lateral and central nodes are often enlarged, rounded, and hypoechoic due to the Hashimoto's. They are not malignant. Hashimoto's can cause a large lymph node, so it will be a big bit of, of problem there. Look for cyst and calcification because they can predict metastasis in Hashimoto's. If patients have Hashimoto's, look for cystic changes for calcification in the lymph nodes. Preoperative ultrasound mapping of abnormal lymph nodes can detect. Uh, underappreciated lymph nodes in 20% uh, can alter the surgical procedure in up to 40% and decrease survi uh, cervical recurrence in up to 6%. So, this is a case was presented with cystic lesion in the neck. Originally, by clinical examination, thought to be might be a branchial cleft cyst or something like that, just clinically. And by ultrasound, there is a cystic lesion with a soft tissue component that's irregular, contains calcification, contains vascularity, and FNA was done and it was a metastatic papillary thyroid carcinoma. It can have different kinds of presentations. What are other cervical lesions that we can see here in the neck? Uh, we have thyroglossal duct cyst, branchial cleft cyst, lymphangioma or what's called cystic hygroma, ranula, dermoid cyst, some non-nodal masses of the neck like for example infectious diseases and here CT and MRI are more beneficial neurogenic tumors like schwannoma neurofibroma and things like that mesenchymal tumors for example a lipoma first for the thyroglossal duct cyst it's a congenital lesion it's usually found in the central or paramedian you usually see it at this part of the neck uh, it's can, from the base of the tongue to the suprasternal region can appear in any of these locations however up to 80 percent are at or inferior to the hyoid bone while 20 to 25 percent are suprahyoid so most of them are at or inferior to the hyoid while the minority is above the hyoid bone so the role of ultrasound here in thyroglossal duct cyst is to confirm the diagnosis 
to see the relationship of the cyst to the hyoid bone, detect internal echoes or internal uh, solid component that can be suspicious for malignancy. Sometimes thyroglossal duct cysts can have thyroid tissue and thyroid tissue develops malignancy in the cyst. So it's very rare, but it happens, it's reported. So detect the presence of thyroid tissue in the neck. Always look for the normal thyroid when you see thyroglossal duct cyst. This might be the only thyroid tissue the patient have. Look for the thyroid, uh, thyroid tissue. Uh, thyroglossal duct cyst, most of the times it's paramedian. It sometimes can be median location. You can see this is the hyoid bone, and you can see the cyst here buried within the strap muscles. It's a very common appearance. You can see it on the CT scan. It is within, looks like it's within the strap muscles of the neck. And it's a typical cystic lesion, completely cystic. And uh, on the longitudinal view, you can see uh, just, um, sorry, just a second. Uh, what's going on here? You ask the patient to uh, extend uh, the neck, okay? And uh, to, to, sorry, to protrude the tongue, and then you can see that the cyst is moving with the movement of the tongue because it is attached to the tongue by the thyroglossal uh, ligament. Okay, again, when the patient extends the tongue, you can see the cyst is moving with the movement of the tongue. Okay, sometimes it might have thick internal contents, for example, here. Uh, proteinaceous material might look like a soft tissue lesion however no vascularity no uh, no definite soft tissue component and you can see the acoustic enhancement indicating this is a cystic lesion and always look for the normal thyroid to confirm that there is a thyroid gland before removal of this uh, thyroglossal duct cyst sometimes it appears as what's called a pseudo solid uh, pattern uh, pseudo solid appearance you can see it's central. This is the hyoid bone. It looks like a solid soft tissue nodule. Okay. Uh, but uh, there is acoustic enhancement. There is no internal vascularity. It's very well defined. And it moves with the tongue, indicating this is a thyroglossal duct cyst. Sometimes it can get infected, resulting in features that are heterogeneous, surrounding edema with uh, increased peripheral vascularity, pain and fever and hyperemia and things of signs and symptoms of infection it's a complicated uh, thyroglossal duct cyst again this is a case of uh, infected thyroglossal duct cyst you can see thickening of the wall and on doppler scanning there is increased peripheral vascularity and hyperemia sometimes complex thyroglossal duct cysts can be seen with soft tissue component and uh, cystic component and some vascularity within the cyst here it was uh, papillary thyroid carcinoma within a, a thyroglossal duct cyst. So even the thyroglossal duct cyst, you need to look for a soft tissue component inside. It might develop malignancy. Rare, but happens. Okay? This is another case of a complex thyroglossal duct cyst. It's now completely soft tissue appearing, and FNA was done, and it was a tumor within the cyst. So what do you think this is? This is a cystic lesion. Okay, it's just inferior to the hyoid bone, and on uh, elongate, elongated scanning, you can see this thing here past, yeah, reaching the edge of the cyst. So, what's this? Is it a thyroglossal duct cyst or something else? Well, definitely, it does not move with movement of the tongue, by the way. So, if you see this, we, I have some, a little video for you. The same lesion, this is the cyst, and if you go inferiorly, you see it continuous with the thyroid gland. So this is a thyroid cyst in the pyramidal lobe of the thyroid. Keep that in mind. You, this is the cystic lesion, and now we are going down, down, and it's continuous with the thyroid that has other cystic lesions. So it might be there. Pyramidal lobe ending with a cyst, okay? Not always thyroglossal duct cyst. Keep that in mind, simple trick. Other uh, cystic lesions in the neck, these are, are the brachial, second brachial cleft cyst. 95% of all brachial cleft uh, anomalies are second brachial cleft cysts. They occur in children 
uh, they occur in children uh, and young adults. It's painless, variable ultrasound appearance. The anatomic location is a clue to the diagnosis. It's usually seen superficial to the common carotid artery, jugular vein, posterior to the submandibular gland along the medial margin of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. It's usually seen here. This is the anatomic representation of the thyrogloss uh, of the second brachial cleft cyst. On the ultrasound, you can see it here. It's uh, typical location, the lo location, location, location is very important. Again, another case of second brachial cleft cyst. You can see it here. This is cystic structure and it's deep to the sternocleidomastoid, lateral to the carotid uh, chain, posterior to the, mandib uh, to the mandible. Very typical location. But it looks like here might someone say it looks like a cystic metastasis. So how do you differentiate it? There are a few ways to differentiate that. First, brachial cleft is usually seen at level 2, while metastatic papillary thyroid carcinoma usually level 3, two, uh, three 4 uh, lymph nodes are involved. You can see like this is a metastasis, this is a brachial cleft cyst. The location is a little bit different. This is the first way. Second, you check thyroid for a primary tumor. Is there a primary tumor? FNA the thyroid, FNA the lymph node. This is the third way, okay? So you either check for the location or you check for the thyroid for possible primary or do an FNA or thyroglobulin assay. These are three ways to differentiate whether this is a second brachial cyst or a metastatic tumor. Other differential diagnosis of this cystic lesions is metastatic squamous cell carcinoma can have necrotic appearance, cystic appearance. However, usually you see this in older age group. It's not the same age group. And you might find an abnormal vascularity inside while second brachial cleft cyst is avascular. It's a cyst, okay? Neck masses in children, these are most commonly cystic hygromas or lymphangiomas, can be hemangioma, fibromatosis coli, some malignant tumors like sarcoma and neuroblastoma. We will discuss the most common one, that is the lymphangioma. It's mostly in children, CT and MRI usually required to determine the full extent and the relation to the other structures. By ultrasound, you see it as a multiseptated, compressible, thin wall cystic lesion. Hemorrhage or infection can occur inside it, resulting in thick wall poorly defined with internal debris, like example in this case. It is usually soft and compressible. When you compress it, it compresses. With This is a 10-month-old 10, 10 female patient with neck swelling, erythema, and fever. In fact, she was a daughter of a pediatrician. So uh, on ultrasound, there is a very ab unusual appearing mass, uh, complex cystic internal vascularity, and it's painful. And this was an infected lymphangioma upon aspiration, resulted in uh, uh, bacteriology of MRSA, methylene-resistant staph aureus. CT and MRI are better in case of infection to determine the extension of the infection to the adjacent tissues. Neurogenic tumors, we see them every now and then. They are not very common, but you need to look for them. They appear as a hypoechoic homogeneous mass with posterior acoustic enhancement, intrinsic flow and color Doppler. They are usually, if you look carefully, you can see it's continuous with a peripheral nerve. There is a nerve arising from it or continuous with it. When you do FNA for these lesions, the thing to notice it's usually cause excruciating pain. The patient is in severe pain, not like usual FNA. So when you have a severe pain with when you are doing an FNA, think of a nerve sheath tumor, okay? And in this case, take out your needle, put a lot of lidocaine because it's very painful. We cannot distinguish between schwannoma, neurofibroma, and malignancy. Do FNA and that's it. This is a 40-year-old patient, history of papillary thyroid carcinoma, presented with right level four possible lymph node. F uh, FNA was done and resulted in severe excruciating pain for the patient during insertion of the needle, okay? So, rescanning the patient and there was a nerve coming out of it and it was a schwannoma, okay? The common sites, usually you see it in the vagus nerve, brachial plexus, cervical sympathetic chain, ventral and dorsal cervical nerve roots. And again, this is another example of a nerve sheath tumor with a nerve continuation. And this is another tumor with a nerve continuation in and out. Okay, so look for this nerve continuation. When a patient comes with, for, for example, thyroid ultrasound, 
always try to scan the palpable where ask the patient where do you feel or try to palpate when you find something palpable scan it what we call clumps and bumps in the neck they're most commonly just cervical lymph nodes and they most commonly benign not necessarily malignant lymph nodes uh, we uh, can we be certain that uh, if it's a fatty mass it's a lipoma but can we be certain that it's a lipoma no it can be a low-grade liposarcoma looks typically like a lipoma here the clinical will determine the definite diagnosis if it is for like Five, ten years, this is a lipoma. If it's a newly developing lipoma, it might be some sort of low grade liposarcoma. Be careful. Because ultrasound is non specific in the evaluation of soft tissue masses. We cannot say. For example, this is a case of typically lipoma. Uh, ten years it's been there, this mass. So it's very unlikely to be a low grade liposarcoma. It can be 50%. Uh, 15% in the head and neck can be subcutaneous or intramuscular. Usually ultrasound will show well-defined avascular or at least hypovascular. They show linear echogenic streaks parallel to the transducer. Okay? Uh, they, we usually say that lipoma is hyperechoic, but this is not the case. This is wrong. It can be, it depends on the amount of fat versus fluid okay and the number of interfaces it can have variable echogenicity it can be isoechoic or hyperechoic or hypoechoic okay most of the times it's hyper but not always so if you see something that's isoechoic it can be a lipoma don't be afraid to report a lipoma okay for example in this case this uh, I know it or something or metastasis or you see it's soft tissue mass it can be a lipoma how to be sure that this is a lipoma Lipoma is soft and pliable. Just compress it, like what will happen here, and you'll see it. It's changing in shape. It compresses. Okay. When it compresses, this is in favor of a lipoma. Okay. And I think power went off. <laughs> Okay, so to continue our presentation, uh, this patient was referred for thyroid scanning, okay, because of some thyroid abnormality. And during the scanning, the, we found this subcutaneous hypoechoic lesion with possible vascularity surrounding, maybe inside it, just a small lesion. Upon rescanning and confirming yeah, to, for further evaluation, a lot of gel was put and suddenly we see this small connection of the lesion to the skin and this was just an ingrown hair hair grown into the central deeper and this uh, some people called it it's a ridiculous finding they call it a radi radiculoma okay just something you think it's a mass it's something hypoechoic oh i find something it's nothing it's just hair growing inside scan the palpable always other uh, solid masses that we might see in the neck are uh, carotid body tumors. We should be careful from uh, about that. They are hypervascular, painless mass in the lateral neck, can be locally invasive in up to 5 to 25 percent, and some of them can metastasize. It's one of the most vascular lesions in the body. It's very vascular. Okay, carotid body tumors, typically you see them between the internal and external carotid it's placed them apart this is very typical anatomic location you find it as a well-defined mass hypervascular this is another case of a hypervascular mass on the mri you can see the internal and external separated by the mass and which is vividly enhancing it's like a light bulb okay again another case with the ct scan you can see it's bilateral carotid body tumor here and here and it's markedly enhancing it's a rare case of bilateral but it happens Okay, you should differentiate that from some things that might simulate it regarding the vascularity that is possibly tortuous carotid artery. It's of course vascular because it's a carotid artery. Usually you see it in elderly with a pulsatile neck mass. You can see this carotid is so tortuous here. You might need to differentiate it from ICA aneurysm before you put a needle in it. Because if ICA aneurysm it will bleed if you put a needle in it and with the CT 
reconstruction, you can see this is an ICA aneurysm, at the bifurcation of the common carotid, okay? Uh, a very common lesion that we see every now and then is epidermoid cyst, which is asymptomatic, can range from few millimeters up to five centimeter. It has multiple different internal echoes and it is avascular, okay? Multiple internal echoes, usually at or in the uh, skin or subcutaneous tissues, you see it there, okay? You can see here, it's a lesion, different, mostly hypoechoic. It's in the subcutaneous tissue. On the CT scan, you can see it's of different densities due to different types of contents. Uh, usually, you see it superficial to the strap muscles. If, you, if it's in the central compartment, you see this is a strap muscles, and you see this is a thyroid nodule, okay? And you see it in the skin, superficial to the strap muscle, avascular, well-defined. Okay, so this will be all for our presentation today of, about the neck masses in general. This talk as well as many other talks are available on our YouTube channel. Just write the name and don't forget to subscribe. And at the end, thank you and thanks the guys inside the company. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.